from well, so I'm going to try to do a little better job of that tonight. I don't like it, but uh, people in the back may not be able to hear as well, but good to see everybody tonight. Hope you've had a good day. Um, storms came through, and then they cleared, so, you know, uh, we might touch on that a little bit tonight. Uh, big day in the Goodwin household. This is our anniversary, so, you know, congratulations to me, condolences to Wendy, but, you know, we, she's put it with me for 32 years now, so... Uh, all right, congratulations. <laughs> 32? Um, close, close. Once you get past 25, hey, what's it doesn't matter. <laughs> oh, all right. A lot of big days going on today. Uh, got a call from uh, Brother Ben a little bit ago. He had sent me a text just uh, being sure that I was covering for him tonight, and I, I didn't reply. I was away from my phone. He, he panicked a little bit, and he finally called me. He said, you are covering class, and I just said, oh, yeah, I got it. I got it. So we're going to do the best we can. So uh, we continue tonight in our study of uh, the minor prophets, and uh, I know a lot of people, that's a real exciting topic, and uh, it's been worse. I taught it to teenagers one time, so that's, uh, that's really good. We try to teach some minor prophets to teenagers. But uh, some of those things where if you get into it and you – you uh, stay a little bit, you're amazed at what you can learn, you know. You, people say you read the same verse 20 times, you know, and you come back and you'll learn something new every time you look at it. And uh, tonight we're talking about Nahum, N-A-H-U-M. I know that's one everybody's really familiar with, and you have that right on the tip of your tongue and know all about Nahum. But he is, it's the seventh book of the 12 minor prophets, uh, supposedly written about the 7th century B.C., and named after the author, Prophet Nahum, and whose name means comforter. And if we look at what it's about, you think, well, who is he comforting in this? But we'll get into that. Uh, very little is known about him personally. It doesn't tell us much about him. Uh, we do know that he is from the village of Elkosh, and that's somewhere in the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, other than that, we don't really know a whole lot. But uh, he was a... Uh, the subject of the, of the Nahum's prophecy or, or vision is the coming destruction of Nineveh. And, uh, you know, the, we say prophecy. A lot of times when we think about prophets, I think a lot of us kind of have this same view. Maybe, you know, it's kind of like this guy's taking dictation from God. He's telling him, stand over his shoulder, say, okay, write this down. Tell him this. But in this case uh, here, uh, Nahum tells us this was a vision that he saw. You know, it was almost like going to the movie and... Uh, the, the detail and everything in this book is amazing, and uh, it's really a, it's really one of the better ones. And I, when uh, Ben first asked me to, if I would take it, and I saw what, what was next, I thought, oh man, you know, I need to look at that one. But I did. And I'm glad I did. But it is a, it's a good one. I hope you enjoy, get something out of it tonight. I really enjoyed preparing for the lesson and going back and looking at this a little bit. Uh, we're going to read read it, but uh, it's a short little little book, three chapters. But we're going to tell a little bit about the history because we need to understand a little bit about Nineveh and what was going on in the time for you to understand the story that's going on here. Nineveh may sound familiar to you, okay? Jonah. All right, same city that Jonah was sent to, and uh, he didn't want to go, if you remember the story. So he, uh, he was not happy when God told him to go there. Uh, Nineveh was to the northeast. He turned and went the other direction as hard as he could go. And we all know how that worked out not very well. But after he had spent a little time in the, in the great fish, then he decided, maybe I need to do what God told me to do, so he went. And uh, here God told him to, to preach repentance to these people. And uh, he, he did, and they repented, and uh, the whole city. And when we read that story, I remember the first time we read it, and he was mad. I was like, why would he be mad? Why would you be mad that people repented? If you go back and look at Nineveh and what was going on, we understand why he was not happy. Okay, uh, Nineveh uh, was the capital of the Assyrian Empire and uh, one of the greatest empires in the world at that time. Um, they were a very warlike people. They uh, worshipped several gods, but one of them, Asher, uh, Syria kind of comes from that. And they, they viewed war as, as worship almost, and they, they were practically at war constantly. Uh, in their, uh, in their history, and they, yet they did a good job of keeping recorded history of all that they did. But uh, one of the kings, in, in 35 years' reign, he had 31 wars. So pretty much every year he's attacking somebody. But the empire kind of grew and swelled back and forth over the 
period of several hundred years. There was a, about 700 years there when it was really uh, probably at its best, uh, the time of conquest, as some historians call it. But um, they uh, not only were they were they warlike, but they were good at it, and they were known for being exceptionally cruel. And you know, you can fight, and then you can fight to win, or you can fight to, to hurt somebody. And uh, they took great delight in the way that they did things. And it goes into great detail in there how they did that. And this is an adult audience, so if I was talking to a younger teenage class, I might not tell all this, but some of this help us get the idea. But their, their methods uh, that they used was, was intimidation. When they, when they defeated somebody, they didn't just beat you. They, they killed as many as they could during the battle. Then they took the rest of them that was left and uh, did unspeakable things to them. They, uh, they would burn them. I know one of the king, he, one of his details, he said, we killed 3,000 men with a sword, and then we burned 3,000 more after that, the ones they captured. Then they would take the others, and they would cut off the ears, nose, uh, fingers, arms, uh, cut their tongue out. They, they would poke out the eyes of a few hundred of them, just let them wander around blind. Uh, you know, then they would take the, one of the worst things they did, they would impale people. You know, they would take a big, long pole, and they would just stick you on it and just let you there die that way. And, uh, and the leaders, a lot of times, they would flay them, which means almost like you do a fish, but they would skin you alive and take the skin and tack it to the wall. And they would stack up stacks and stacks of bodies, hundreds tall. And they did all that to intimidate, so the next city they came to, the word got out, you better not fight these guys because that's what's going to happen to you. And if you did give up, uh-oh, excuse me. And if you did give up, then uh, a lot of times... Uh, you know, you would enslave you, and uh, they would make you pay a huge um, payment, extortion, basically, and that's how they kind of uh, funded their empire. Was off the, all everything they took from everybody that they defeated, and then the ones that they didn't, and they left them. They would make them pay them yearly payments of gold, silver, whatever, so that they had everything that they needed. And then the other thing they would do to keep you from from uh, from organizing and fighting back against them later, they would take all the people, a lot of the people, and they would just disperse you, and they'd take you somewhere else and repopulate in a whole different place, spread you out so that you not have anybody in common. So you had to become part of that new, and you kind of lost your identity as a nation. And they did that to Israel. We, we hear about that in the Bible. So they were, uh, they were not very nice people, to say the least. Uh, very warlike, very cruel in their, in their behavior and how they did things. Uh, but they were also a very advanced people. Uh, they had the first professional standing army. And a lot of times back in those days, if you went to war, you just you'd gather up a bunch of guys and say, hey, let's go fight these people over here. You know, they didn't do that. They had an organized modern army like we do today, one of the few that there was, at, well, the first one at that time, but had a high degree of training and organization. They were divided up, and they had cavalry. They had light infantry. They had chariots. They had archers. They had engineers. Uh, they had suppliers, so when they went to fight, they, they were prepared. And the fact that they did it all the time, they were good at it, so they were professional. You know, I was reading an article today about, about us preparing possibly for war with China one day and China with us, and they were saying, well, you know, China's got a lot, and they got some pretty good technology and all that, but, but we've been fighting for the last several years, and we got battle-hardened warriors. They don't. They had not been in a war in a long time, so we might have some advantage there if it comes to that. Hopefully it won't happen, but... It kind of reminded me of this when I heard that. You know, these these people they fought all the time, so they they were battle hardened. They knew how to do it, and uh, they uh, they had a huge army too. You know, a lot of them maybe a, a big army at that time might be if you had five thousand men. Uh, at its height, the Assyrians had they could put two hundred thousand troops in the field. I mean, that's like a modern army today. Just imagine supplying all those guys. And they had a supply set up where they could, they could renew their horses, 3,000 horses a month. They could roll new ones in there as they, or other ones got tired. So they were very, very good at what they did. Uh, the engineers they had with them, when they besieged a city, which was pretty common in those days, where they thought you'd surround a city. Most everybody had a wall city. Uh, they would sit around you and siege. And then their engineers would either tunnel underneath your walls. They would pile up dirt. They had they called siege engines or battering ram. They would have a kind of a... V-shaped tent with wood to protect them, and then underneath there they had a big log, and they could knock down your walls. So, you know, they, they had it figured out. They, they knew how to fight. They were good at it. So because of that, 
uh, people didn't like them very much. And you can see then why Jonah, when he was told, go preach to these people, like, why well, I want to go preach to them? This is the worst people in the world. And then when they repented, he's like, I, I don't want them to repent. You know, they've done terrible things to everybody. They deserve what they get. And so you know, that that's kind of the situation that we're in. Well, but they did repent. And that kind of leads us to our story here today is that about for 100, 150 years or so, uh, the people of Nineveh turned to God. Now, after a couple of generations during that time, though, they went back to their old ways and uh, probably even worse than they were before and started doing all those things again. Now, we talked about them uh, invading Israel. You know, uh, God's people went through about 200 good years or so there when they had... Uh, they had uh, Saul and David and Solomon, good years. And then after that, uh, Solomon's sons bickering and fighting and split the kingdom into the ten northern tribes and two southern, Israel and Judah. Judah was more, uh, did a better job of hanging on to God than, than the Israelites, the Israels did up north. So eventually then uh, they came and were destroyed and taken away into captivity and dispersed, like we said. And that was the end of the Israelites, the, the, of the Israel. Those ten northern tribes, we hear sometimes about the lost tribes, that's when they were lost. They were never, couldn't reestablish themselves again. You know, the Jews were big, very big on, on their genealogy, their lineage. They couldn't trace it after that because they were so spread out, not that group. Um, so uh, Nineveh at the time of the writing here, which we we'll throw this in here too that makes it even, even more amazing, is that uh, when, when Nahum made this uh, prophecy, saw this vision, Nineveh was at the height of, of everything. It was the best it had ever been. They were by far the strongest nation in the world. Um, uh, Assyria Paul was the leader. They were located on the eastern bank of the Tigris River. They were a good defensible place there, but the city itself was amazing. Um, it was similar to what we read about Babylon, but it was uh, took up about seven square miles of just the inner city, not to mention the suburbs. It was surrounded by walls that were 100 feet tall, wide enough that three chariots could race around it side by side, and then had a moat that was 150 feet wide and 60 feet deep. And it had 11 different aqueducts bringing water, excuse me, 18 different aqueducts bringing in water. So they, they were set, they said they could hold us a 20-year siege. If you want to siege them, go ahead. We'll, we'll outlast you. We'll, we'll be here when you're tired and go home. So they were pretty much undefeatable, unpenetrable. They had the best army in the world, best trained, uh, now, I didn't mention also about their, about their technology. This was the end of the Bronze Age, beginning into the Iron Age. They were one of the first people to really use iron, and they used it to make their weapons. They had swords made of iron, and when you went into battle with somebody with a bronze sword and you had an iron sword, you know, you just you hit one of them, there's breaks in half, and you're still fighting. And then they had, uh, you know, iron uh, wheels on their chariots. Uh, they had axes. They had armor. They were one of the first... People have army boots. You hear about army boots, but they had a, they could, they had, they could travel quickly and all over the place. They, they, they wore boots that had armor in them and had grips on the bottom. So, you know, they were very well prepared technology-wise too for everything they did. But this, this, this city that was at the height of the world and was dominating. Here comes this little guy that nobody knows, and we still don't really know Nahum, and says, "Y'all are about to go down. You know, your end is near." And everybody's like, "Really? You?" you I don't think so. You know, nobody can beat, nobody can beat us. But we see that's not necessarily how it goes. Uh, so let's just look, and I'm going to be reading from the King James Version. Let's let's read a few verses, and we'll make a few comments. But I wanted to lay a little, a little groundwork there for what our lesson is tonight, and kind of where we got to. Uh, chapter one, verse one. And before we do that, let's talk about how this, how the book's laid out. Nahum's three chapters, and it lays out a very good outline. The first chapter is this, talks about the destruction of Nineveh is decreed. Second chapter is the destruction of Nineveh is described. And then the last one talks about the destruction of Nineveh is deserved. So three little kind of themes for each chapter as we go through here. Another thing about this book is, uh, I'm not an English literary man, but this, uh, the book was, was written, part of it especially, as an acrostic poem. So it was, it was poetry, not just, not just a story, but it was written in, in a, a nice way. Acrostic means you take the first letter of the alphabet and each line started with a different letter, like 
I think it was the Hebrew alphabet, it wasn't ours obviously, but it'd be like A, B, C, D, and each one of them had something to say. So it was laid out that way to make it easier for it to understand. Uh, but let's look at the first chapter. First one says, the burden or the prophecy against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Alcazar. Like I said a while ago, this was a vision that he saw. God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges is infuriates. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. So let's take a minute and just look at those. That's really the key to this whole thing is, is that the Lord is slow to anger, but he is also a righteous judge. So we learn a little bit about the, the character of God and kind of how he does things. He is very patient. We see that with us. You know, thank goodness God's patient with us. You know, he, he gives us a second chance. I mean, he, he went to the Ninevites. He sent to the Syrians that lived in Nineveh and gave them a chance, even though they were not even God's people. They were wicked uh, Gentiles, but gave them a chance to repent, and they did, which I think is also a lesson to us. I, I think I mentioned this in here before in classes, but sometimes I think we take it upon ourselves to judge people and not share the gospel with them because we don't think they'll accept it. Jonah didn't think they would accept it, and they did, okay? So, you know, sometimes that person who is maybe in the worst way also needs it the worst, and they must be, they may be close to listening, you know? Sometimes you're not ready to bounce up until you hit rock bottom. So sometimes you got to find that person that's rock bottom, and, and maybe they are willing to listen. Uh, but, you know, he, he gave them that, and they repented. But then they turned back. So God sees here, he gave them 150 years, before he came back and said, okay, I gave you a chance, uh, but you turned your back on me, and you went even worse the other way. Uh, he goes into a few more things here. He talks about in that one, the whirlwind and the storm. I thought about that a while ago when the little bit of storm we had blew through, but you know, we, we've seen tornadoes, different things around here. We, we know how that's like, and it's, that's, that's just a, a touch of what God is capable of. You know, I know 2011 was the last bad tornado outbreak we had. It came through down where we used to live down that way. And then I'm old enough that the another one came through there in 1974. It was a big round of tornadoes that came through there uh, when I was a kid. I remember uh, we had been to church on a Wednesday night and uh, was getting ready to leave. And uh, my dad was at work and my mother and me and I think maybe one or, one or two of my, maybe I had one brother born at that time, but uh, we started to go home. My granddad said, well, that looks, that looks really bad. This was before James Spain and weather radar. He said, you know, we, we gotta, we're we got going back. So we went back to my great aunt's house. She had a storm uh, cellar there and got in it. And actually the storm was closer to us there than if we'd went on home. But, you know, that storm came through and, and just devastated everything. I know my, my grandparents my, uh, on the dad's side lived in a little community called Twin and uh, between you and Brent and Winfield there. And uh, it it blew their house away. It, it was built on a concrete slab, and there was nothing left but the slab. There was not even any debris. It was just gone. And it killed the neighbors on each side of them, but luckily they were in the storm shelter. So, you know, just seeing the devastation. If you go through Phil Campbell today, even once it's been 10 years, there's areas where there's just no trees, you know. But just think about the power of God and what he can do, all the things that he can do. Uh, not somebody you want to be on your bad side. Uh, verse 5 said, The mountains quake before him, the hills melt, the earth heaves his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the fierceness of his anger? Anger, that fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown by him. And then he turns around and he says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. But with an ever-flowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place, and darkness will pursue his enemies. So, you know, in one breath he's telling the bad part about God, and in the other part he's telling the good. So it depends on which side of that anger you are. You know, if you trust in God and you do what he says, he's there for you. You couldn't ask for anybody else to be a better, a better friend and protector. But if you're on the wrong side of him, then this is what you have to look forward to. Um, All right, let's, look, let's go on to chapter 2 a little bit right here. Uh, in chapter 2, uh, in, in chapter 1, we said the destruction of Nineveh, Nineveh is decreed. So here he makes the announcement that they were going to be destroyed. And then in 
chapter 2, he talks about the destruction of Nineveh. And this is, I mean, some of the most descriptive writing you'll ever see. I mean, uh, I know the, uh, I guess Alfred Lord Tennyson has a poem about the charge of the light brigade or something like that. I can't remember, but he talks in great detail. I mean, you feel like you're in the battle. He talks about as you're going in, the horses and the thundering hooves and the flash of the sword and all that. This is the same story. I think Tennyson must have stole it from this. I think he read Nahum and he wrote his story. But uh, here he goes, he does great detail about what, what it's going to look like. Uh, he says, He who scatters has come up before your face. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power almightily. For the Lord will destroy the excellence of Jacob, like the ex will restore the excellence of Jacob, like the excellence of Israel. For the emp emptiers have emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. The shields of his mighty men are made red, the valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots come with flaming torches in the day of preparation, and the spears are brandished. The chariots rage in the streets. They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. So, I mean, he, he's going into, you know, just really a great storyteller here about what this is going to look like. And the amazing thing about this is, is when, when Nineveh was destroyed in 612, about 50 years after this, uh, this is exactly what it was like. The, they were attacked by uh, the Medes, uh, which also the Medo-Persians group, same group. Uh, Babylon and I think the Scythians, but there was three groups that came together and attacked uh, attacked them, and they had red uniforms. I mean, he, he even told the color of the the details of what it was going to look like when the people attacked them. So you know, it's amazing. If nothing else we get out of this, it's that God is in control in the Bible. Is what it says it is. It's accurate. You know, because once we see what he said here, before it ever happened, it happened exactly like it said, even down to the color of the of the uniforms that the opposing uh, armies were going to have. Um, he remembers his no the nobles. They stumble in their walk. They make haste to their walls and defenses prepared. The gates of the river are open and the palace is dissolved. It is decreed she shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up and her maidservant shall lead her as with the voice of doves beating their breasts. So back up there just a little bit. The gates of the river are opened. I uh, mentioned a while ago that Nineveh was built beside the Tigris River. And Tigris and Euphrates, Crescent, the Fertile Valley where civilization started, uh, was modern day Iran, Iraq, in that part of the world today is kind of where this is. And uh, they, uh, the way the river came in there, like I said, they had aqueducts from the hills in different places bringing in fresh water because this was a city of about 150,000 people. Think about 150,000 people living in one place in those days when you didn't have electricity, air conditioning, indoor plumbing, running water, but yet they made it work. You know, th these people were not only very warlike, they were also very intelligent. They were good engineers, designers. Uh, they were the first people to, to design to a circle to have 360 degrees. Uh, what else did they do? They set up a government where they had provinces because it was so broad, had people in charge of each little area, and then reported that back to the king, kind of like our government sets up today with governors. Uh, you know, they were great at metalworking and metallurgy. You know, they 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 um, uh, they had a they had a uh, a library in the city, the biggest of its kind, the first that had over I think it was between twenty and thirty thousand of these clay tablets with all this knowledge of the world that was at that time in that library. So they, they were also cultured, but they were cruel. So, you know, but the, the, the river at one point, the way that they were defeated was that they, the enemies diverted that and they came in underneath where that, where that came in. It also talks about their walls. You know, uh, they were made out of mud brick. So that's, they didn't have a whole lot of stone, uh, close to them that they could quarry and build things out of big chunks of rock. So they had to make mud bricks. And sometimes if a flood hits that, that's not very good. So the, the enemy used that against them too. Um, verse 9 says, Take spoil of silver. Uh, wait a minute. Go back at the 8. Though Nineveh was old and like a pool of water, now they, flew, they flee away. Halt, halt, they cry, but no one turns back. Take spoil of silver. Take spoil of gold. There is no end of treasure or wealth of every desirable prize. She is empty, desolate, and waste. Their hearts melt, their knees shake. Much pain is in every side, and all their faces are drained of color. 
Where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions? Where the lion walked, the lioness and the lion's cub, and no one made them afraid. This was a, a big deal to them too. The Syrians considered their, their, their young men and their warriors like lions as they were out on the prowl. So here he's kind of using that, kind of mocking them in a way. He says, here's a dwelling place of lions. What, what's up with y'all? No, you can't, you're not winning now. Uh, you're not fighting very well. And, and going back a little bit about them, you may have saw some of this stuff maybe in pictures or things, but the, the Syrians, that one of their big symbols was a, a bull with wings and a man's head. And all those men on those statues and reliefs and stuff they had, they had like these curly beards. You know, so you may remember seeing some of those in history books or in, in pictures somewhere. Uh, but that, that was kind of plays in here where he's talking about how they, how they think about things too. Uh, verse 13 says, Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour, devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messenger shall be heard no more. Okay. So chapter 1, he talked about the creed, what's going to happen to him, uh, that God has had enough. You know, he's, he's gave you a chance, but you, you, uh, you repented for a while, and you went back to your evil ways. Now you're going to pay for it. And then in part 2, chapter 2, he describes in great detail what it's going to look like when they are uh, when they are subdued, when they are attacked. And then chapter 3 talks about the destruction of Nineveh is deserved. He talks about the reasons for the destruction and that the destruction here is inevitable, that it was going to happen. Uh, so reading here in chapter 3. Um, Woe to the bloody city. It is full of lies and robberies. Its victims never departs. That describes them pretty much to a T. They're a bloody city. They're built off of blood. You know, the blood of their enemies is what made them great. That's where they got their riches from. It's what made them famous was for their cruelty. And But I says all that is lies and robberies, and its victims never depart. Like everybody in the in the in in that part of the world knew who they were and didn't like them very much. You know, um, you hear sometimes, uh, which I'm an Alabama fan, so y'all take that with a grain of salt my next comment, but, uh, you know, sometimes the people have talked about the Alabama fatigue, uh, we're tired of seeing Alabama the national championship. But some, just anybody else, we're sick of seeing it. Of course, the Alabama fans, we're not. But yeah, you go roll tide, you know. But I think that's kind of how we there. It's like we're, everybody, everybody, just somebody beat beat the Syrians. We're sick of them. They beat. They've been bullying everybody for years. Somebody take them out. We're tired of it. So kind of a little bit how they were. Okay, uh, a little bit more of the description part of it in verse in uh, chapter two here of. Uh, Chapter 3, verse 2. The noise of whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots. Horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spears. There is a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses. Because of the multitude of chariots, of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorceries, who sells nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. That's pretty graphic, okay? You know, uh, you ladies, I never wore a skirt, but, you know, you don't want your skirt blowing up the wind. So he said, we're going to flip it up. We're going to show all your weaknesses. We're showing everything. Uh, so I will cast abdominal filth upon you and make you vile and make you a spectacle. He says, you're going to be a spectacle. Everybody's going to look at you and say, hey, look at them now. You know, everybody likes to see the bully get beat. So, you know, everybody's going to be looking at you and say, you know, look at what happens to you now. Uh, it shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? And then verse 8, he goes back to a little history here. He says, Are you better than non Amman, which is Thebes? It's another name for the city of Thebes in Egypt. Uh, it was, situate, was situated on the river, River Nile. It had waters around who, whose ramparts was the sea, whose wall was the sea. Thebes was thought to be an undefeatable city. The way it was positioned and the way it was in the, you know, the great uh, Egyptian army. But Assyria had defeated them a few years before. And similar to how they end up getting beat here, they, they completely destroyed Thebes. But Thebes did come back. Assyria, uh, Nineveh didn't. It says, Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength and it was boundless. Put in a little bit more her your helpers. Yet she was carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed in pieces at the head of every street. They cast lot for honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. So again, he touches here a little bit on how cruel they were. I mean, they kill the babies. They just take them by the heels and 
dashed them up against the wall. I mean, they were mean people. You also will be drunk. You will be hidden. You will seek refuge from the enemy. So you're going to run around, stumble around like you were drunk, just in panic, trying to get away. 13, all your strongholds are fig trees with dropping figs. They're shaking and falling in their mouth. Surely your people in your midst are women. The gates of your land are wide open for your enemies. Fire shall devour the bowers of your gates. So here, no offense to you ladies, but, you know, war in those days. Now, we, we got females who are in the military. Uh, they, they can fly an airplane. And they can shoot a gun. They can do those things where you can kill from a distance. In those days, war was hand-to-hand -hand combat. And if you were bigger and stronger and more skillful with a, with a weapon, you're going to win. So if you had an army of men going up against an army of women, that's not going to end very well. And he said, this, your armies are just like a bunch of women trying to fight. You're not going to do very good. Uh, and then he kind of makes you fun of them here. Draw, draw your water for the siege. Fortify your strongholds. Go into the clay and tread the mortar. Make strong the brick kiln. So, hey, you need to make some more bricks. Make your walls a little taller. Get some more water. Put out the fire because it's going to be bad. Uh, then down at the bottom, uh, probably the, the, the end of it for them, 19, your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. All, hear, all who hear news of you will clap their hands over you, for upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? So he says, this is fatal. It's final. There's not going to be no coming back from this. Your, your wounds are gone. And everybody's going to be glad. They're all going to clap when they hear you lost, you know. Uh, for upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? It's all these people if you've been bullying for these last few hundred years, they're going to be glad now that you're, you're going down. Uh, so talks about the reason for destruction. Uh, a little bit back up history here a little bit on this. One thing that makes this interesting to me, which I like history, uh, was that it ties all these things together. You know, some people question sometimes the Bible. So that's just... That's a, a Jewish fairy tale. That's just a, a bunch of stories. It doesn't mean anything. That stuff's not even real. And for several years, even a lot of the historians didn't believe a lot of things in the Bible. They said, I don't, I don't, we don't see, I don't think these people ever existed, these names of these kings, uh, these cities. We can't find them. I think that's all a fairy tale. But in the last few years, through archaeology, we started finding some of this stuff. And the city of Nineveh, it says, would just be reduced to nothing, and it was to the part now it's just a, a pile of rubble is it. But it, it, we didn't even know where it was until about 1840s, 1847, 1850. There were some archaeologists went over there and they started finding some of this stuff. They said, hey, we have found the city of Nineveh. So, you know, it, it's here. And the thing about it is they started finding the pieces that they could put it together with because like we said, these people had a pretty extensive library. And their rulers, a lot of the... the corroboration for these stories come from the kings because the kings were proud of what they did. When they went out and, and conducted a campaign, a, a war, they came back and they wrote about it in great detail. Where we hear about how many of these were killed and how they were killed and how they tortured them, that was the king telling that and recording it. They were proud of that. So when we started reading these things, that they, when we found these details, they matched exactly what the Bible said. The years matched, the times matched, uh, and we didn't just have it from them. Also, as we find, started finding stuff in, in Egypt, who was involved in this too, they told the same stories. So it's a triangle of stories between what the Bible says, the Jewish position on it, the Assyrian position on it, and the uh, Egyptian, all corroborated each other's stories. It's like having three witnesses to the same event. They all said, this happened, this is how it happened, these were the names of the kings, this is how it happened, you know. Uh, because sometimes they say, well, that's just, those numbers are too outrageous. There's no way that that could have been. But it, but it was. That's how, that's how it happened. Uh, matter of fact, one of the uh, rulers, I uh, can't remember which name he was, uh, might have been Sargon, maybe, or, or Sinareb. I think it was Sargon. But anyway, he was one who came back after they, his father is one who had carried the uh, Israelites into captivity and completely wiped them out. Well, a few years later, he came back, his son came back and was going to attack Judah, the southern tribe. And he came to, to Jerusalem, capital of, of uh, the southern part. And uh, he, he didn't attack Jerusalem uh, uh, start off with. He started taking all the smaller cities around and doing just what he did. We've been describing here to all of them. Well, then when he got to Jerusalem, he sent one of his generals up and he stood outside the gates. And you can read this in Isaiah where he talks about 
all the things he said. He was basically mocking God's people and said, who's going to save you? You're God. Look at what I've done to all these other people. What makes you think your God can stop me? So that didn't sit very well with God. So I think that's where we come to this point. Well, you know, you dared me, so now we're going to see what happens. But he, uh, he told them what he was going to do to them. So they surrounded them. And they started in with their siege tactics and started even piling up. They would pile up dirt and make a ramp so they could get to the wall. Well, God, uh, uh, Hezekiah was the king. Hezekiah goes to the, pre, to the uh, prophet. Uh, I think it might have been Isaiah. Well, it was. It was in Isaiah. Yeah, so it was Isaiah. So uh, then he uh, prays to him, and he tells him, God comes back and says, don't worry about it. They're not even going to shoot an air at you. Nothing to worry about. And at this, at this army, at this time, the Bible says he had about a hundred and... It was about 200,000 men, I think, with him at that point. And during the night, the angel of God came down and wiped out about 185,000 of his men. So the next morning when he gets up and finds up most of his troops are dead, he packs up and goes home. So, you know, God was in control. But we, we find that story, the same story it's told in the Bible. When we found Nineveh, when they started digging up all the records, they find where that story is told. Now, they don't tell that God's angel killed him, but they do say he was really tough. Hezekiah was a great, strong king, and we, we let him pay us off, and we went home. So they tried to save face with their story, but they never did that in the past. They never let somebody off the hook. They always, they, they, if they came, they were going to beat you, but they didn't at that point. So all the other stories match. So again and again, we see here that in the biblical writings, the Egyptian writings, all that stuff matches. And even in the, you know, we said these, these uh, Assyrian kings kept great records of all the, of their battles. After Jonah came and preached to them and they repented, there was a period of time there where they didn't tell anything. They, they call it the, they went dark is what the historians say. So there was a time when they weren't out fighting. You know why? Because they had repented and they were at home being good. They weren't out killing and raping and mutilating people. They were at home being good people. Well, after a while that wore off and they started doing it again. And that's when, that's when Nahum came into the picture. Uh, so everything we see in history, the more we learn, the more it tells us there is a God. The story we read in the Bible is true. It's the inspired word of God. And it's, what, you know, it's there for a reason. Uh, so even we read a little three-chapter book of a minor prophet in the Old Testament, there's something we can learn here. I think basic things you can get here out of this, this is my... Moral of the story, I guess you would say for tonight, is that God is patient and he's forgiving even with the evil Gentiles. But however, God is also just and he will eventually punish sin. Um, if we put our trust in God, he's on our side. We're going to experience the good side of him. If we don't, if we follow wickedness, then he's going to be on the bad side. We're not going to like him very much. Uh, and for our nation today, I think it proves that no nation, no matter how rich and powerful, is above God's law and judgment. And if you stray away from God... Uh, and you do evil, he eventually he'll you'll pay for it. Uh, you know, um, I, I, I like to be a glass half full kind of guy, but you know, uh, the more we see of the things that go in our country, the more I, I'm concerned. Are, are we turned into Nineveh? You know, I hope not. Uh, but um, you know, in some ways that we are. But you know, hopefully we'll be like some other places. We got so well, if you can. You know, even Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, if you can show me a few good people, I'll save it. So, you know, I think it's kind of up to us for us to be the, the salt, the saver of our country. And, uh, you know, we can't, um, maybe we can't, we can't change everything, but we can change uh, our, our little part, you know, by doing our part and making our part of the world better, and that'll spread. So we all have a part to do. And uh, no matter how small that part is, we can all be effective for, for God to make our, make our world a, our world a better place than what it is. And uh, I think that's our job and that's our charge from this lesson tonight is, you know, what we don't want to be Nineveh. We, we don't want to be the one that God turns his back on and says, okay, I gave you a shot, gave you a chance, but you turned your back on me. We don't want to be that. Okay. Questions or comments? Tonight turned into a little bit of a history lesson, but like I think, I think that helps us to understand where all this comes from, why Jonah did what he did. Because I'd always wondered for years before I started studying this, why would Jonah be mad about people repenting, you know? And why would, you know, because those people deserved what they got in his mind, and, and they eventually got it, but uh, they did have an opportunity to repent and do better. 
and for us, we need to take advantage of those opportunities. All right, uh, next week, uh, I'll be back. I'll be doing this one more time, and uh, after that, I don't know. Um, Ben's going to be in and out this summer a good bit, and he was, uh, had asked me, I've kind of been the stand-in sub for a couple of classes lately, and that's fine. I like, like doing that, but uh, he, he'll be in and out. Sometimes I may be here, and uh, sometimes uh, Brother Brooks may pull a double duty and do the 3.30 and the 6.30 class. I don't know, but we'll kind of see how the summer goes. But I will be here next week talking about our next one. Okay. Any, anything else we need to talk about? Offer Willis bow in prayer before the bell ring. Father, we're thankful for today. Thank you for this opportunity you've given us to come here to gather as God's people to steer and listen to my word. Pray, Father, we would think on these things we've, we've learned tonight and we apply them to our lives, become better Christians from them. Father, realize that uh, every, every lesson in the Bible is, applies to us in some way or another and everyone is good for something, even if it's like the Ninevites, even if it's just a bad example. Father, let us take these things and, and apply them like we said and make us better. Father, be with the ones who are not able to be with us tonight, the ones who are sick, the ones who have lost loved ones, be with Brother Ben as he travels, uh, bring him back safe travels. He'll be back with us as soon as possible. Get with us throughout the rest of this week. Forgive us for sins and finally save us in heaven. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.